when God created the world and everything in it, the very last thing that he made and put into the beautiful world that he had made was human beings. God, so that they could appreciate all that God had made. And so, <clears throat> at the end of the sixth day, God puts men and women in this beautiful garden, which we understand was at the center of the first day of the lives of these human beings was actually spent on God's rest day, day seven. It was as if God had done everything and said to these people who were the pinnacle of his creation, here you are guys, enjoy Now, he had actually said something else to them before that, which I deliberately missed out. When he made men and women, God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the birds of the air, the beasts of the field, and the fish of the sea. I'm giving you a job to do. <clears throat> which sounded like a pretty tall order, until they woke up and found that it was God's rest day and what they were supposed to experience was actually the rest that God had created. It's interesting that the Bible never talks about an eighth day. But of course, we know what happened. It wasn't very long before men and women had spoiled everything by disobeying God and they're excluded bad to worse and God has to do something different he starts to raise up the family of Abraham as those who are going to experience his love and show the rest of the world what all that is like and one of the promises that he makes to Abraham when he calls him is Abraham, you are going to have one descendant in whom all the nations of the earth are going to be blessed. One descendant. And he talks, he's talking, of course, about Jesus, who is coming not just to restore Israel to what they were supposed to be because they deserted God as well, but actually to bring blessing to you and I, to the whole earth and to the whole creation. And so, this one descendant eventually appears in the fullness of time. And his arm. And isn't it interesting that as he's dying on the cross... One of the things that he says is, it is finished. He wasn't talking about his own life. He can't have been because it wasn't finished. And we know that he said several things after he said it. The clue is actually in the other story that I've told you. That at the end of making the world and all that was in it, once he'd made men and women and thought about resting on the seventh day, God said, as it were, it's finished. It's done. I've made all that I'm going to make. It's done. And here you are. And so Jesus, as he is hanging on the cross dying, He's actually doing something that no one can see. He's actually come to the end of the mission that God sent him to do. And he says, it's finished. Perhaps not with the same sense of joy with which God said it the first time round. 
but something else has been finished. A new creation, a new order that everyone can be a part of. So that all the nations on earth can be blessed. And then he dies on the cross. And for a couple of days, nothing much seems to happen. It's interesting that those who followed Jesus didn't expect anything else to happen. Resurrection, well, yeah, that was an idea that was around in Israel at the time. But what they thought that meant was that at the end of time, and he would judge them, and he would say, well, if you've been good enough, that's great. You can rise to life. If you're not good enough, you can rise to judgment. That's what some Jews thought resurrection. In resurrection at all, they were called Sadducees. They thought, nah, not going to happen. No such thing. Nobody expected a situation where one person rose from the dead. And as far as the disciples were concerned, although Jesus had said things about it, Throughout his ministry, they thought, it's got to be all over. Luke's account, which Cynthia just read to us, is really, really interesting. Because more than the other Gospels, it emphasizes this sense that no one expected anything to happen. You know, the, 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 the women go along to the tomb as soon as the Sabbath's over. Well, they're exbody, there'd be no time for that on Good Friday. And they were talking to each other and saying, who's going to move this stone away? Because we can't do it, you know. And then, of course, they notice that there's no, must be two angelic beings. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? You know, he's not here. You're not going to find him. And they go away and, uh, and they say, you know, we, they go along to the disciples and they say, look, you know, we've seen these angels. They say that Jesus is alive. And the skeptical disciples look at each other and say, yeah, go on, pull the other one. You know, no way. Except for Peter, who kind of thinks, I better go and see what's gone on here. And he kind of looks in and, well, something's happened here, but I've no idea what it is. And if we read on in the story, Luke's account actually doesn't have any of them um, seeing Jesus. Luke's resurrection story is actually the road to Emmaus, where very late that night, there's sort of two men walking out of Jerusalem to this village, and Jesus comes to walk with them. You see, <clears throat> the biggest change in the history of the universe seems to have noticed. <laughs> and Jesus continues to appear to his followers. But he starts to talk to them about something which he had taught about before, but this time it's a bit more intense, about the kingdom, we're told. He talked to them for 40 days about the kingdom. And he starts to see, has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and telling them to obey everything I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. A new kingdom has begun. It began the moment that Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. It was possible from that moment for anyone who believed in Jesus to be part of this 
new kingdom. And the disciples are sent out to say to, to all nations, nation, as God promised to Abraham, and we have been caught up in that movement and we are still part of it. It may not feel to us like we're living in a new age. Because as with the first disciples, everything was designed to send a kind of different message. Work through faith. You have to believe in Jesus. And you may have to believe that, although all the circumstances around you are sending you a different message. It wasn't obvious on the day of resurrection that this fundamental change and shift in everything had happened. The disciples had to kind of learn to appropriate that by faith. And many of the things that happened to them sent another message. Did they still believe it when some of them were crucified upside down as some of them were? Well, they seemed to. It had got hold of them that much. The truth is <clears throat> that the cross and the resurrection changed everything. There is a point, Jesus Christ, who is, still is the Lord of heaven and earth. Nothing about that is ever going to change now. And we are called to be part of that experience the Lord being with them always to the end of the age. The trouble is that the church has kind of ceased to understand this message or turned it into a travesty of what Jesus was originally intending. <clears throat> in other words, that we kind of think, well, the world we live in doesn't look very much like the kingdom. But actually, <clears throat> when I get to the end of my life, because I've believed in Jesus, I'll go and live with him in heaven. And won't that be fantastic? And so there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions of Christians, who in effect are sitting on their backsides waiting for the second coming. Jesus never intended that to happen. In the cross and resurrection, a new age has begun. If we're Christians, you and I will never be more saved than we are at this minute. Because the main thing has already happened. He took your case, he laid your sins on Jesus, and he declared you innocent. And he made you a part of this fantastic movement through which all the world is going to be blessed. Now, <clears throat> just like on the day of resurrection, it's probably going to seem to you and me like there's an awful lot which sends us a different message. Nothing's happened. The world's a terrible place. The world's getting worse and worse by the day. Yeah, it may be, actually. But it doesn't alter the fact that there's a new king on the throne. And he will always be the king on the throne. We sing it, don't we? You know, forever you will be the lamb upon the throne. You know, gladly bow the knee and worship him alone. You know, we sing it but maybe we don't live it the way that we should. And what God has given us in his grace and his mercy is a phase in our lives now between the time when we first believed in Jesus and the time of our death. Kinds of stuff which is going to count for the moment when he comes again. 
when all of the stuff we have done to grow more and more like Christ will be made permanent in that moment, vanish. Now, what that means is that life is far too exciting now to sit on our backsides and wait for the second coming. Please don't do that. Because if you do, you're, you're just denying the whole, th the whole tenor of the New Testament. The kingdom of God means that every kind word, every thoughtful act, everything done in the name of Jesus Christ counts in eternal terms. That's why God doesn't say anywhere in the New Testament, this is fine for you to do and you should work hard until the time you're 65 and you get your pension. The New Testament doesn't know anything about that. Now, you know, nothing wrong with pensions, right? But I'm saying that, you know, some of us who've worked very hard for the church for years and years and years and feel that we need to kind of back off from that, that's absolutely fine, but that's nothing to do with the kingdom. You know, the kingdom, we carry on doing these things, and that counts as well. The more we change to be like our Savior, you know, a day comes when all of that will be made permanent. It's worth making that effort because the New Testament tells us so. And after a whole chapter of teaching about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, I don't know whether you've ever read the last verse of it, but Paul says in the last verse, because of all this, you know, you need to know that nothing you ever do be steadfast and immovable because nothing that you do in the name of Christ will ever be in vain. So if we think that the meaning of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that it's all about sort of getting a new life and a kind of meal ticket to heaven, we need to change our thinking very drastically. There is a new king around. His name is Jesus and all authority in heaven and earth has been given to him. It may not look like it to you, but that's the truth. We seek to be like him Nothing that we do in his name is ever going to be wasted 